Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. This is Paige Vanderverst. She's a grad student in the College of Forestry and Natural Resources. She's about to get her master's and she is going to talk to us about rabies. All right. Um, so yes, my name is Paige Vanderverst and today I am going to be talking to you about rabies. Um, a little bit about me, uh, as Tom said, I am a graduate student. I am in the Escobar lab at Virginia Tech, which means that I study disease ecology and biogeography. Now, what that means is I study the distribution and spread of different diseases across different landscapes. So instead of looking at kind of the molecular spread of different diseases, I, I look at how they go across continents and states. Um, the specific topic of my thesis is the spread and suitability of rabies transmitted by vampire bats in the uh, American continents, so from Canada all the way down to the bottom of South America. Um, I primarily study Desmodus rotundus, which is the common vampire bat, which is the bat down at the very bottom right of your screen. Um, some people find them intimidating. I think they're kind of cute. Um, but vampire bats are one of the few hematophagous or blood-feeding bats um, on the planet right now and all of the adaptations they have that make them really good at um, feeding on blood also make them very good transmitters of the rabies virus. Um, I'm originally from Johnson City, Tennessee, so I'm close to this area. My dad actually grew up in Blacksburg um, and is pretty well familiar with Virginia. And another fun fact about me, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Tanzania from 2016 to 2019. And while I was there, that's where I started to study uh, disease transmission across landscapes. I worked really closely with a couple of different organizations to study how diseases were transmitting from humans to uh, chimpanzees. Uh, specifically, I look at zoonotic diseases. Um, some of you might have heard the word zoonotic before, specifically recently because of the coronavirus pandemic. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that originate in animals. One of those is rabies. So the way this presentation is gonna work is we're gonna go into a little bit of an introduction about uh, rabies, about the disease, then move into some history and impacts. Uh, then I wanna tell you guys about how to identify rabies in pets, domesticated animals, or wildlife, and, and what you should do in those situations. Uh, then we're gonna talk about rabies in the United States, what exactly is being done about it, and I will give you some resources. So what exactly is rabies. Um, what are What is it? What is the cycle? And what are the symptoms? So rabies is a disease um, caused by a virus. So the virus is technically called rabies lysivirus, or RABV in abbreviation, that attacks the nervous system, it causes brain swelling, and eventual death. Once a person or animal shows clinical signs of rabies or symptoms, Survival is fairly rare. There are only three people in the United States that have ever survived rabies, um, rabies disease without the intervention of a, disease, of a vaccination. Rabies, however, is preventable by vaccination, and vaccination for humans and most animals is readily available. So what kind of animals can get or um, spread rabies? Mammals. Mammals are the main transmitters and hosts of rabies virus. Um, so this includes things like pets, dogs, cats, ferrets, um, exotic pets such as guinea pigs or ferrets, different kinds of livestock, so horses, cattle, pigs, uh, wildlife such as bats, rabi uh, raccoons, skunks, and humans. Humans can get and spread rabies. But uh, organisms such as birds, um, amphibians and reptiles cannot get rabies. Um, they cannot maintain it. Other mammals that are less likely to have rabies are things like small-bodied rodents, um, rabbits, and opossums. I don't know if anybody's heard the, the kind of myth that possums spread rabies, but uh, marsupials like the American opossum, are um, their body temperature is too low to maintain rabies within their system. So RABV, or rabies virus, um, is a negative strand RNA virus of the genus Lysivirus. Um, Lyssa is the Greek goddess of rage or madness, which is what the disease is named after. It's also a member of the Rhabdoviridae family. Um, rhabdo, meaning rod, is named for the characteristic rod or bullet shape of the virus. And rhabdovirions are highly stable and composed of organized complexes of genomic RNA 
and nucleoprotein. So that's this genetic material, um, this red kind of swirly material within the middle of the, back of the virus. And they are contained within a lipid envelope um, or a membrane that is derived from the host cell. That's how rabies gets past the immune system. It derives a lot of its uh, membrane features from the host cell or the cell of the organism that it's breeding within. The cycle of the disease is um, fairly simple, yet also very, very interesting. So the rabies virus uh, generally enters the body through a bite or a scratch from an infected animal or an individual. The rabies virus from the infected saliva of that individual enters the wound and is exposed to the muscle tissue. The rabies virus then travels through the nerves into the spinal cord and the brain. This is where it replicates very rapidly. Now, rabies virus can take up to three to 12 weeks to transmit from the site of the infection to the brain, and it can take that long for an individual to start showing symptoms. During this transmission phase, generally there are no signs of the illness within the individual. So when it reaches the brain, the virus multiplies very rapidly and passes into the salivary glands. This is where that neurological phase begins. This is when animals show, start showing signs of the disease. So to get a little bit more technical, the infection spreads to the peripheral nervous system or from the muscle into the disease through neuromuscular junctions. So where a nerve meets the muscle, um, it goes through these receptors and, and propagates within the muscle and is amplified, then goes into the nervous system. And the infected animal usually within about seven days of sign or symptom onset, so again, those neurological phases, uh, within about seven days, generally that individual dies. Prior to intense neurological symptoms, the, the signs and symptoms of rabies can often be mistaken for um, the common cold or a different kind of virus. So. Uh, often the first couple of symptoms that appear are fever and headache or um, tingling at the side of the bite. Other symptoms might be a sore or swollen throat, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or fatigue. Um, again, many times this virus is misdiagnosed as something else, and it doesn't really become apparent that rabies is within this individual until those neurological symptoms start to show. So apologies, my dog is barking. There are two clinical types of rabies um, that start happening when the neurological process, when the neurological symptoms start to happen. So there is furious rabies, which is something that you're probably more familiar with. So furious rabies or encephalitic rabies causes hyperactivity, hypersalivation, so excessive drooling and foaming at the mouth, and periods of aggression alternating with periods of lucidity. So when you think of rabies, this is the aggressive, angry, uh, Cujo-like rabies that most people think of. Uh, furious rabies can also cause hydrophobia, which is the fear of water, and it can also sometimes cause aerophobia, which is the fear of uh, fresh air or breezes. Generally, furious rabies ends with a death by cardiorespiratory arrest. The less well-known rabies is paralytic rabies or dumb rabies. Um, this is caused. Um, so paralytic rabies is more common in bovines, so cattle, um, and paralytic rabies is also the type of rabies that is commonly spread by vampire bats. So for me, this is the rabies that I study most closely. Um, as in the name, par uh, paralytic rabies, it begins with uh, flaccid muscle weakness um, at the onset of the infection and starts at the site of the bite. Uh, this is followed by gradual paralysis and eventually death by respiratory failure. So Oftentimes, paralytic rabies is misdiagnosed, and this contrib contributes to the underreporting of the disease. So oftentimes, when a bat gets paralytic rabies, most people expect to see a very hyperactive bat that's uh, behaving erratically and out during the day. But paralytic rabies in a bat is more likely to be shown by a bat that is on the ground and not moving. So um, oftentimes, people will pick up this animal thinking that it's hurt or that its wing's broken. Um, when really it's, uh, it's carrying paralytic rabies, that person can then be scratched or bitten, and that's how rabies um, can be transmitted from bats to humans within the continental United States. So where exactly did rabies come from as a virus? 
current theory is that it originated in old world bats or European bats. Um, however, it was probably quickly transmitted from old world bats to dogs in European, um, in the old world in Europe and Asia. Um, so dog maintained rabies is uh, propagated globally. It occurs globally. However, rabies associated with bats is only really found in the New World or in the United States and Latin America. So it's unclear exactly when this transmission between bats and dogs happened and where and how that shift occurred. Now, this transmission between two different species is often called spillover in uh, epidemiology. So that is the transmission of a virus across the species barrier. Um, so that spillover event, we're unsure when that exactly happened. But generally, cycles look something like this diagram over on the right. Rabies virus is transmitted to a dog or a bat. Bats often spread rabies to one another during roosting behaviors. So they'll groom each other, lick each other, bite each other. Um, and that's how rabies is spread from one infected individual salivary glands to the rest of the roost. This bat will then be exposed to wildlife, humans, or livestock either from blood feeding like a vampire bat or they will roost in human um, human housing so they'll they'll roost in the roofs of different of people's houses um, or they will be exposed to other wildlife out uh, while they're foraging and that's how rabies is spread um, within Latin America mostly Despite the fact that vaccines are very, very prominent, uh, rabies still kills 40 to 70,000 people every year. 40% of these people are generally children. Uh, most human deaths caused by rabies occur in Asia and Africa where vaccination is limited and most people live in vulnerable housing um, where wildlife, is, wildlife and livestock commingle with people very, very readily. In the United States, in the United States, there are about 5,000 animal cases of rabies reported annually. Now, again, some of this might be underrepresented because paralytic rabies is less easy to identify. Within the United States, there are some key hosts or key organisms that maintain and spread rabies. Um, in domesticated animals, cats are far more likely to be diagnosed with rabies than dogs mostly because dogs are generally outdoor or indoor animals and um, are more readily vaccinated than cats. Most people think that they don't have to vaccinate their indoor cats for rabies. Not true. Um, you are actually legally required to vaccinate cats, dogs, and ferrets in the state of Virginia. Oftentimes, again, a bat will be exposed to a cat indoors if that bat is roosting in the roof of the house. Um, that cat can then be infected with rabies. Uh, within eastern United States, the biggest transmitter of rabies are raccoons. Um, raccoons are actually a very large transmitter of rabies within the state of Virginia. We'll talk a little bit about what Virginia is doing about that um, later on. But other wildlife to look out for are skunks or foxes. Um, foxes are larger transmitters of rabies out west. And then in Puerto Rico, uh, mongoose are the big transmitters of rabies. Something that you want to keep an eye out for is um, this kind of cross-hatched pat cross pattern uh, across the United States. So bats have been found with rabies across every state in the Union besides Hawaii. Um, so bats, again, are a large transmitter of rabies. So what exactly should you look for um, when you're trying to diagnose or identify rabies in wildlife or domesticated animals in your area? So again, before symptom onset, rabies can be very difficult to identify because the early, early symptoms are so similar with other viruses, headache, fever, um, kind of general malaise. But once those neurological symptoms start, it's a little bit easier. So if you find um, a wild skunk or a raccoon in your backyard, uh, try to look for things like trouble moving or walking. This can be both present with uh, ferocious rabies and with paralytic rabies. Um, lack of flight response. So most wildlife are generally human phobic. They're, they're kind of scared of humans or at least leery of us. So um, if you see this animal um, and they see you and they do not respond with flight or if they respond with aggression, that could be a delineator of rabies. Um, excessive drooling or foaming at the mouth is obviously a pretty large indicator of rabies. 
but also unusual behavior um, besides the typical aggression can, can denote some, rab uh, some rabies-like symptoms. Um, one kind of key identifier that a lot of people think of is that if you see a wild animal like a skunk or a raccoon or specifically a bat out during the day, then it's 100% rabid. Um, that's not necessarily true, specifically in the morning. So a lot of times wildlife will be moving in between roosts or dens early in the morning or kind of earlier in the evening. So if you see a skunk during the day, it's not 100% definitely rabid, but definitely keep an eye out for some erratic behavior. Um, again, never approach or try to handle wildlife in your backyard or around your house. Um, this can get you bitten, um, which is not only an issue for rabies, but also a lot of other zoonotic diseases. Once, again, once rabies symptoms begin to appear, the infection is almost always fatal. Um, and to this end, you need to seek um, care the moment you or your pet are bitten by a wild animal or even a domesticated animal that you don't know the vaccine status of. So seek medical guidance immediately. So what exactly is being done about rabies in the continental United States? One big thing is the presence of vaccine clinics. Vaccines for animals and for humans are widely available. Um, there are FDA approved vaccines for dogs, cats, ferrets, horses, cattle. There is no approved vaccine for swine, but people are definitely working on it uh, as we speak. And uh, low cost and free clinics are fairly widely available. Um, for example, Fairfax County is having the below listed dates for low cost rabies clinics. If you have a local healthcare provider for your animals, it's best to ask this individual if there are low cost or free rabies clinics occurring. There are also three year vaccines available for most dogs. So you pay once, three years, the animal's covered for vaccines. Um, you wanna make sure you maintain that documentation though, both you and your veterinarian, because that's going to be important if your dog is ever exposed. People at high risk for exposure can also re receive pre-exposure vaccinations. So there's seven vaccines total uh, to prevent rabies if you are exposed. You can receive the first three or the first four if you are an individual that works with animals, works at an animal rescue, works in a veterinary clinic. Um, these things will help you from having to receive all of those vaccines post-exposure. Another initiative that is happening right now to prevent rabies is the oral rabies vaccination program. Some of you might have heard of this. Um, it is a program for the immunization of raccoons in, Eastern, um, in the Eastern United States. So the purpose is to prevent the spread of raccoon transmitted rabies further west. So the purpose of this initiative is to create a barrier, a vaccine barrier across the um, Appalachian United States to prevent that raccoon rabies from transmitting into places like Tennessee, Kentucky, Western West Virginia, things like that. So what happens is these packets of vaccine are put into little blocks of bait. So these bait blocks are generally made out of like fish meal and very, very smelly, uh, very appealing um, bait for raccoons. And all of these bait blocks are loaded into a helicopter or a low-flying aircraft, and they're chucked out the window into uh, the Appalachian Mountains for the vaccination of local raccoons. Now, these vaccines can also be picked up by bears, by dogs, by cats. If your dog picks up one of these vaccine packs, say if you go down to Damascus, Virginia, to ride on the creeper trail and your dog picks up one of these bait packs, it's not going to hurt them. Um, but the main thing is we don't want human children to chew on these. Um, so if you ever see a bait block like this, it's a rabies vaccine for a raccoon, which I think is pretty interesting. The oral rabies vaccine program is a cooperative effort between the USDA, BDH, or Virginia Department of Health, and the CDC. And Virginia's participated in this effort since 2002. And so far, it appears to be working. There hasn't been a large uh, transmission of rabies from raccoons into the Western United States since this initiative started happening. Um, so I think it's, it's a really, really cool, um, interesting initiative that continues to happen every year. So what specifically can you do as an individual um, to, to prevent rabies and to learn about it? 
So if you are exposed, what should you do? Or if you find a, a piece of wildlife on your property that you think potentially could have rabies, what should you do? Again, big reminder, there is no successful medical treatment for clinical rabies infections in humans. Um, however, prompt vaccination is highly effective at preventing the disease. So if you are bitten by a suspect animal, flush the wound with soap and water and contact your local, local health department, animal control or animal rescue immediately to try to contain or um, capture that animal um, because we want to test that animal for suspected rabies. If you cannot capture that animal, try to identify it at least and then seek medical guidance immediately. Um, a veterinarian or a healthcare worker can submit animal remains for testing. Um, this means that the animal will be euthanized and most often their brain or brain stem will be tested for rabies. Now, this does not necessarily have to happen for domesticated animals. So if you have a dog, cat, or technically a ferret um, that you are bitten by or that your animal is bitten by, there are a couple of different options um, after exposure for what's going to happen. So this is all dependent upon the vaccination status of that animal. This is why I said it was important for you to maintain those records of when your dog, cat, horse, ferret, whatever was vaccinated. Um, if that animal is current on their vaccines, um, that animal can be observed by the owner for 45 days and a booster vaccine will be given. Um, if that individual has never been vaccinated, um, that animal can be euthanized or it will have to be under a four month strict quarantine and a vaccination will have to be given within 96 hours. If that vaccine is out of date, there are a few other options, but again, a very strict four month quarantine will be placed. Um, if that animal starts showing signs or symptoms of rabies, they will be euthanized and tested for, for rabies. So again, what are some recommendations for preventing rabies or for identifying rabies around you, your animals, or your household? Always vaccinate your animals. You're legally required to vaccinate some of your animals, but it's a good idea to vaccinate your horses or cattle if you have them. Um, do not approach or handle wildlife if you can avoid it. Specifically, do not do this without proper training or protection. If you work at a wildlife rehabilitation facility, I know that it's kind of impossible to not come into contact with wildlife, but I know Rocky Raccoon is super cute, but if you are at your house, do not put out bait or start feeding the raccoons. Um, it's a bad idea. You can be exposed and your pets can be exposed to rabies. Um, something else you can do is to bat proof your home. So again, bats are a big transmitter of rabies. So what you can do is try to seal up cracks and crevices around the outside of your home. Make sure you're listening to hear if you have bats in your ceiling. If you do, definitely try to get them out as quickly as possible and try to make sure that your roof, ceiling, and attics are, are well sealed and insulated. Um, try, again, try to bat proof your home to prevent you from being exposed to them and to prevent them from being exposed to you. Um, report suspected cases of rabies. The best thing you can do is report it. Um, this allows the Virginia Department of Health and researchers like me to be able to know where and when rabies is occurring. This way we can track it and put into action good mitigation strategies. And if you are exposed, the best thing you can do is seek medical guidance immediately for both you and your pets. And this is a list of resources that I have for you. So again, the Virginia Department of Health um, has a lot of very good information about uh, rabies, the Virginia guidelines at the very top link. Um, the next two links are NCBI papers uh, about rabies. So one of them is titled Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Rabies But Were Too Afraid to Ask. Um, others are some history about rabies. Um, you can also contact the Center for Disease Control Prevention for questions about rabies or for resources about rabies. And the best uh, organization to contact is the Virginia Department of Health. You can go to www.vdh.virginia.gov to find your local office um, and to contact that individual. This is going to be the closest office to you geographically, and they can offer you specific guidance for your area. You can also call 804-864-8141, which is the Virginia Department of Health Rabies Specialist. And with that, I will take any questions and thank you all so much for your time.
Thank you, Paige. Does anyone have any questions? You can just unmute and ask. I have one. Um, I saw in your um, uh, one of your slides that you had guinea pigs as uh, one of the domestic pets. What about rabbits? So lagomorphs or rabbits are uh, not well known to carry rabies. They can get it, um, but they don't transmit it very well, mostly because rabies, uh, rabbits don't bite as well as um, cats or dogs, but rabbits can get rabies. Um, they're just not known to be a, a big transmitter of it. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Paige, do you know how long, if you get the, uh, the preventative vaccine, do you know how long those last? So I know they last for up to three years if you get the three, um, the three booster vaccines uh, for pre-exposure. Yeah. Um, so for instance, people um, that work internationally or work in rabies prone areas. Uh, so for instance, when I was in the Peace Corps, I was given rabies vaccines. Um, I know they're at least good for three years. Some people say up to five, but the best thing you can do is um, ask your employer if your rabies vaccine is required um, or your healthcare provider when you need to re-up on those boosters. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Hearing none. Um, thank you, Paige. Yeah, you're welcome. Perfect. Sorry, I think I went through that a little bit faster than I did in practice. <laughs> that would, just from a public speaking, that would be the only thing that I would say is just slow down and breathe. <laughs> but thank you. This was interesting. Yes, it was. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Thanks, Paige. Anything. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.